Speak, O oh Lord. Tell us your word. Speak to our hearts. Fill our hearts and our minds with your promises that we find in your scriptures. That's why we come to worship. We're glad that you're joining us here at Harlandale Christian Church today as we worship the Lord, as we come together to fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to seek his will, to allow him to speak to us through his spirit who's here in our midst, through his word, through our fellowship. Oh, how wonderful the word of God is and how wonderful the promises of God's, uh, God are to us even today. David said in Psalm 119 and verse 103, our theme verse for our message series this month, how sweet are your words to my taste, O Lord, sweeter than honey to my mouth. How sweet are the promises of God. Let's worship him together in, in praise and in adoration and prayer and in fellowship. Let's pray to the Lord to now, to, together now. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come to your throne of grace, your throne of, of wisdom and love as we worship you. Speak, Lord, to us today through your word, through these songs and hymns that we sing, through our time of communion at the Lord's table and through our fellowship with each other. Speak, O oh Lord. Show us your will, your purpose, your life, your love, and most of all, your grace and your mercy that you've given to us through your son, Jesus Christ. Receive our worship and our adoration as we lift up your holy name today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
life You are love You bring light to the darkness You give hope You restore every heart that is broken Great are you Lord It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise We pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise to you Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, it's your
Each Lord's Day, when we come together in the house to the house of worship, we have the privilege, the opportunity to share with each other, to pray for each other's needs, to lift up our, our praises and our thanks to the Lord. That's a part of our fellowship. That's a part of our being a part of each other's lives and letting the Lord touch us and work in us. Also during this worship time, we set aside time to thank the Lord for his grace, his mercy, for his love, and for the sacrifice of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. We share in this time of communion, the Lord's Supper, where we partake of the unleavened bread that reminds us of of the, the body, the flesh of Jesus when he was nailed to the cross of Calvary. We, per, we, we take and, and drink from the cup, the fruit of the vine, that reminds us of the blood that Jesus freely, willingly shed from those wounds as he gave his life, his love, his sacrifice, so that we might have a way to be redeemed to have salvation to have forgiveness of sin the hebrew writer says in hebrews chapter 12 let us run with per perseverance the race that is marked out for us fixing our eyes on jesus the author the pioneer the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's consider our Lord Jesus Christ, his love, his sacrifice, 
his grace and mercy for us as we sing our communion hymn today the old rugged cross and as we meditate upon the words of that hymn and as we partake of the bread and the cup let's thank God for his love his grace his mercy pray with me father in heaven we thank you for that sacrifice of your only begotten son Jesus who though he was sinless took our sin to the cross of Calvary his body his flesh was was broken was pierced was 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 cut his blood was shed so that we can believe in him and have your grace your mercy and have forgiveness of our sins help us to remember that old rugged cross and look forward to the day when Jesus comes again to redeem us to receive us to you for our eternity in heaven we pray in Jesus name amen
You know, sometimes we might, we might be discouraged because of tr struggles and trials and problems that come in our lives. Maybe we, uh, it, it seems like uh, things are wasting time for us or we miss an opportunity and, and, or we have wasted potential. But God promises us that he will use all things in our lives to work out his plans. Nothing is wasted when God is involved in our lives. His goodness overflows. His goodness abounds. Oh God, help us to see and know your goodness in our lives, even today. Grant us eyes to see your goodness in, in every situation in our lives. Grant us the faith to believe that you are a good, good Father and you work out good for us. Thank you for Jesus, the author, perfecter of our faith. Speak to us today, Father, in your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're continuing in our series of messages called Sweet Like Honey. The promises of God. Welcome to week three of our four part series, where we're looking at some of God's many promises that are made throughout the scriptures. So, if you missed the last two weeks, we first talked about God's promise to give us rest. And last week, we looked at God's promise of grace, His grace. We remember it's by grace that we're saved and by grace that his strength is made perfect and complete in our weakness. And we have to create space for God to do his thing in our lives. We have to live by faith, walk by faith, and be willing to step out in faith. We have to learn that he's working even when we can't see him working or feel his presence in the midst of adversity maybe even suffering in our lives. Today, I would like for you to think about a time maybe that you felt like God had left you, had left the situation that you were experiencing in, in, in that time, in that, that moment, in that month. Think about when you felt left alone. Maybe in this time you struggled to experience God's goodness. It felt lonely to you, isolating and dark. Maybe you weren't experiencing God like you wanted to, or maybe like you used to. He seemed away, absent. But the truth is, and Scripture reminds us over and over again, God is always with us. 
He will never leave us or forsake us. He's working all things, even the hardest things, together for good. Now, I'll admit there are many times and, and seasons in our lives where it's nearly impossible to imagine things getting any better. But maybe it's not as much about things getting better or getting easier or situations getting fixed. As we're about to, to learn, maybe it's about fixing our eyes on the goodness of God. Let's read Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 together as we begin our look at the promise of God's goodness. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 28, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You know, God is not just working for the sake of staying busy, but it's working for our good and ultimately his glory. Now, I want to maybe correct some thinking that many folks use this passage and say that God brings good to everybody. That God is always making good happen in your life. And if, and if something is not happening good, Maybe there's something in your relationship uh, with God that is blocking it. That can't be farther from the truth. That's not what this passage says. That's not what Jesus said, or, or what Paul said to the Roman church. That's not the message, even in the original language. This passage says, God works good for those who are called to his purpose for those who love him and that's something that we need to understand we may not have good things happen for us all the time but God is working for our good and ultimately working for his glory it might be hard to believe at times but it's true just think what if God defines good a little differently than we do? Here in this verb, in this verse in Romans 8:28, Paul uses a particular Greek word for our English translation, good. And the, the word essentially means good whether it's seen to be good or not. Good, whether it's seen to be good or not. Let me give you an example of this. Do you have somebody that you still pray for to come to know Jesus Christ personally as their Lord and Savior? Chances are you've prayed dangerous prayers for them if you, if you, if you have. You ask God to do whatever it takes to bring them to a saving faith. And when I'm doing this, I have to remember that the thing that I'm praying for is for God to do whatever it takes to get these people to a point of salvation. But what this might mean is that in the process, there might be physical or temporary hardship. Regardless of what it looks like, the important thing is for salvation to happen. And that can be translated and, and transferred to our thinking about just about any other thing for, whom, for people that we pray for. Even in our own lives, we want good to happen, but we are going to face some hardships. And God ultimately gets the glory, whether it's for the salvation of a, of a sinner or working for good in the hardship, in the lives that we live. Sometimes it's hard to see, but I want to talk a little bit this morning about God's promise to work for good, especially in times when we don't see the good coming to pass. What areas is he working in? I think there are at least three areas that we're going to highlight today any time that we have conversation about the promise of God's goodness, we need to remember his working in these areas. 
the family, our families, that's the starting place for most of us. We so deeply care about and love our family, and it pains us when a family member is experiencing some kind of hardship or pain or illness or discouragement. We have to continue to believe the truth that God is not wasting these moments. God is not wasting this potential. God is not wasting this opportunity. Maybe you're familiar with the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. Jo Joseph is one of the 12 sons of Jacob. But at some point early in their lives, the other sons decide to sell Joseph into, into slavery. He even spends time in prison. But eventually he moves up in the ranks of power and ruling in the nation of Egypt. The story concludes with the famine in the land. It's a famine that, that Joseph's other brothers and his, and his father get involved in because it affects them as well. Finally, the story culminates in a reunion between the family members. But how would Joseph react after all these years, which began with betrayal from his own brothers, his own family? Would he hate his brothers? Would he exact revenge? Or would he be kind and gracious? Here's what the Bible says about this. In Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 and 20, Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Friends, even people in Joseph's own family intended something for evil. But he recognized that in spite of their desires, God was going to use this for good. Here's the reality. There will be people, whether they are a part of our family or not, there will be people who will, see, who will seek out to orchestrate things for evil against us and, and our families. The Bible even promises that if we are followers of Jesus Christ, we will be hated. We will face persecution, punishment, and pain for our faith in Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22, You'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Think about that, friends. Are we willing to shift our mindset to one of Romans chapter 8 and verse 28? Will we make the decision to believe God is still working for good even when our family experiences uh, 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 bring hardship or heartache of some kind? Maybe that's the exact season and time that you find yourself in right now. And if that's you, friends, I encourage you to stand firm. Have faith and trust in the goodness of God in the midst of your situation. Even if it's hardship, God works goodness. But God is not only working for good in our families, he's doing so in our jobs, in our work as well. So you may be retired from regular work. Some of us work at home. Some of us work a, a, a regular time slot in an office setting. Others of us travel around the country, around the world doing business. Regardless of what your work looks like, the reality is the same for all of us. There are other people in involved in our work, our jobs and our, our homes and our lives. And this means that we have to uh, have an, an amazing, that we all have an amazing opportunity to share God's goodness with those who are next to us, who are around us, who see us, who hear us. But it also means that coworkers might just try to treat us poorly 
Or in a more extreme case, how do you believe God is still working for good when you get fired or laid off? Have you ever lost a job or had to transition from one job to another where there was great risk involved in that transition? How did it feel? What were you worried about when this happened? And then how did it resolve? Maybe it was even the decision to retire from full-time work that you had to struggle with. How did that resolve? Friends, remember that God is not going to waste anything, even this confusing situation that probably weighs heavily, heavily on you about a work or uh, job situation. Sometimes we need a motivational speaker to tell us, just get back up and keep going. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of truth in that. But the Bible repeats a different notion, a different idea, a different lesson over and over again to us, especially in the Old Testament. In order to see that God would truly waste nothing, God invited his people, the Israelites, to remember to remember him, to remember what he has done. In Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 15, God's message was, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. The Israelites were slaves. How much worse could it get? God says, remember. How did you come out of that? God worked his goodness in spite of the suffering, in spite of the hardship. It might have taken time. It might have taken uh, efforts. But God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And so I wonder if the key to continuing to move forward when there's uncertainty in work and uncertainty about making decisions for work. I wonder if it's simply remembering what God has done in the past. Remember the times that he showed up when you least expected him to in your life and your work. Remember how faithful God was in the midst of your sickness or your pain or your despair. Remember how he met you in the middle of your grief and he carries you through, still carrying you through, maybe. Remember the last time your role in your job didn't quite work out, and God provided an open door to either a different job, a different task, a different place, or leaving that job. Friends, if we are simply willing to believe that God will truly waste nothing, there's nothing that can hold us back from accomplishing his plans and his purposes here on this earth. And today I want to close our time by talking about a final area of life where the goodness of God abounds. It may sound strange, but I, leave, I believe it's important to talk about how God works for good goodness in our churches. Now, because of what we do when we come to church, just like this morning, we probably assume that, that God's working for good and the evidence is all around. But the reality is, just as we know, many churches struggle to keep their doors open, to keep their preachers engaged in ministry, or even to keep people engaged in a relationship with Jesus personally. So in God's house, the church, how do we believe God won't waste anything when the current state of affairs is not where it's been in the past? I think the answer lies in a proper understanding of how the evil one works in this world. You see, not just in regard to churches, but all of the different areas of our lives that we've discussed today. The devil will do anything he can to distract us from and distort 
God's truth. And even the promise that we're talking about today, the promise of his goodness, of his bringing goodness from anything that comes. If the devil can get a single church to stop believing in God's goodness, even in the church itself, then that ministry will be derailed. Here's a promise that Jesus makes about the devil. I hope you remember this in John 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. This is the character of the evil one, the devil. What better place for the devil to work than among God's people, those that are seeking to do his will? There's no reason for the devil to be worried about a group of people that's not doing anything for God's kingdom. But a church like this, he's got to be a bit worried. So we can expect certain things from the devil while knowing that the power of Jesus Christ is much stronger, much more powerful. In fact, at the end of this verse in, in John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus makes a promise about himself. And I trust this promise, and I hope that you do too. In the second part of verse 10, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Friends, this promise of goodness includes the promise of abundant life. And that's what God has for us in our church, in our homes, in our jobs, in our families. God has the, has the patent on abundant life. And he is able to make immeasurably more than all we, we ask or imagine. Able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. So friends, with this in mind, let's invite God in today. Let's open our hearts and our minds to the goodness of God. And, and rather than saying, God will do good for everyone, let's know that God's goodness is his promise, even in hardship, grief, pain, suffering. The same God who used all of the adversity in Joseph's life for the good of all God's people said in Genesis 50, 20, as Joseph said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. This is the same God who, while his people were being carried off to Babylon as slaves, he said in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Friends, this is the same God that we worship today. We ask for him to come and fill our church with his goodness his kindness, his grace, and his mercy. And even today, those of you in this room or, or sharing with us online who are going through a season of adversity and hardship and struggle, we pray for you to be strengthened and encouraged today. I encourage you with these words. Put your faith in God. Trust his plan for your lives. Because he's given us a promise of goodness for all who love him, for all who are called according to his purpose. When we come to this conclusion that God is indeed working for our good and his glory, when we know that he won't waste anything in any area of our lives, we will live an abundant life here on this earth. We'll experience God's goodness every day of our lives. We can do that when we give our hearts, our minds, our faith, our lives over to our God, to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our song of decision and dedication today says, Lord, reign in me. 
when God reigns in us through his spirit, when Jesus is our Lord, our Savior, God works goodness in every area of our lives. Will you ask him to reign in you today? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your promise of goodness. We understand, we know that it's not, ju- not a promise that you only give good to those who love you. But it's a promise that you will work out your goodness and your glory in every area and every facet of our lives when we give ourselves to you. Thank you for that promise. We trust you to take every moment, every situation, every detail of our lives and use it for your glory, for your honor. Lord, reign in me, reign in us, reign in your church here today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. sunset sky but my one request Lord my only aim is that you reign in me again Lord reign in me reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour you are the Lord of all I am so won't you reign